Okay, shalom, and welcome back to our course in Torah and psychology. Today, we're going to learn a very special and perhaps even life-changing idea. It has to do with this time of year, but you might be watching at a different time of year. Don't worry, it's okay. Uh, you can still apply the lessons to your life and gain tremendous insight about your life from these ideas. Okay, so yesterday in the Jewish calendar, it was Rosh Chodesh Kislev. That means it was the beginning of the month, the Hebrew month, Kislev. So there's this idea that's brought down by Rabbani Yamim Mizrahi from a Mekubal. Uh, some people quote it as Rabbi Chaim Vital, others quote it as others, but the idea is still relevant. Um, what's the idea? Well, they say there's what's called a segula. A segula is sort of like the Jewish way of saying a holy omen, like meaning this is really good unsolicited advice. We recommend you take it and it's going to be good for you. It's sort of like Jewish mother syndrome, like please do what we're telling you. I promise it'll be good for you, right? So that's sort of what a segula is, but it's based in holy Torah ideas. It's often based in Kabbalistic wisdom from the Zohar. So here's this following idea. There's a segula, a segula, that if we stop uttering complaints, if we stop complaining from Rosh Chodesh Kislev until the last night of Hanukkah, well, we can actually merit a miracle for ourselves. So people have different reactions to this. A lot of people are like, wow, that's awesome. I want a miracle in my life. And some people are like, are you kidding me? You think I could stop complaining for that long? So I want to acknowledge both of those things and we'll get into the ideas of both of them. So first of all, I'd like to invite you to take a moment, press pause, pause, right? Press pause and maybe write down one, two, or even three miracles that you would welcome into your life. Perhaps they're tremendous miracles, something you never thought could be possible. Perhaps they're little miracles, like I'll finally start working out or, um, I'll have the courage to call this person that I've not called. You know, those would be considered miracles as well. So maybe just take a moment and try to open your heart to a few different miraculous ideas that you would love to see come to fruition, right? Maybe you'd like someone that you know to get healthy if they're not healthy. Uh, it could be a variety of miracles, right? Maybe I'd finally have the self-confidence to ask this person out or you know, initiate this or that or whatever it may be, just take a moment to think of what possible miracles you would love to see in your life. Okay, so I'll count on you pressing pause so I don't have to stop talking. <laughs> so now the question is, so what? So why? What's, what's to do with miracles? What's to do with complaining? What does this have to do with Torah and psychology? Okay, so first of all, what I'll say is that the thing that we see that God hates the most palpably, visibly in the pshat, in the simple text of the Bible, uh, and you can see again and again in the time when the Jews were in the desert, God hates complaining. And we complain, and then it says again and again, God hates complaining. And I was thinking about getting the sources out for you and finding all the different verses in the Bible where it says God hates complaining, but it's so rampant. You could literally just look it up yourself. All the examples of when the Jews complained in the desert, or they didn't have food, they didn't have water. And these are legitimate complaints, right? If you're in the desert, you're completely reliant upon God. You don't have food. You don't have water. It sounds pretty reasonable to complain for water and food or one of the complaints they made let's say is against fiery snakes i might complain against fiery snakes coming to attack me as well and even still god hates complaining so it's like okay so we know this is a torah idea and we also know psychologically like study any form of psychology go to any ted talk and you're going to find tons and tons of videos and ideas and papers about the negative impact of complaining. In fact, what happens is we begin to wire our brain, right? Let's say, if, let's say we could imagine what it looks like, the neurological synapses firing. Um, and what happens is we sort of carve deeper and deeper uh, synapse like triggers that will be deeply embedded into our, into our brain, into our psychology, the more we complain. We actually uh, let's say we like firm this way of behaving up in our psychology, in our mindset, the more we complain, the more it becomes a practice that we do. And actually, if anyone has studied NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, you can start to understand how the brain really adjusts to those behaviors that we practice and give it the way we think about it. So we know both clearly from a Torah perspective and a psychological perspective, complaining is really quite bad for us. But 
I still don't get it, Neely. What does this have to do with having a miracle in our lives? And what does this have to do with the time that you're describing? Well, first of all, let's just be simple. We said that this, this idea, the segula of stopping to complain, it goes, extends until the last day of Hanukkah. Well, everybody knows that Hanukkah is about the miraculous, right? Hanukkah is the miracle of the oil that was supposed to last for one night. It lasted for eight. It's the miracle of a tiny little army of little scrawny Maccabee Jews against a massive empire's army. And we succeeded. You know, there's a lot of miracles going on here. Even the number eight of Hanukkah signifies that in Kabbalah and in numerology, that which is beyond we see this even if we turn an eight on its side, it forms the infinity sign, right, for that which is beyond. So we know that this time of year is about miracles. But again, even if you catch this video at a different time of year, you'll be okay. So I'll just show you short, a quick diagram that I drew, just ah, flying lights, a small, uh, simple scratch drawing. And uh, I'll help explain what, what this has to do with the time of year. Okay, so here's my diagram of time. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> okay, so let's say, uh, so in Judaism, time is not linear. It's not like a timeline that you might see in a history book. It's cyclical and it's always moving up. And again, this is an idea from the Kabbalah, from Kabbalistic and Hasidic ideas, that time is a spiral. So let's say here's in the beginning, let's say here's Breshit. Well. Let's say, um, so there's an idea that when we begin the Torah, it's time for new beginnings. So in that time of year, every single year, let's say this is the year zero. Let's say this is the year 5781. That's where we are in the Jewish calendar. So there's like an energy channel here. I drew the other energy channels. I'll show you in a second. There's like an energy channel along this period point of the year for new beginnings. For example, we hit the month of Adar in the time of Purim, and it's a time for joy. Right, So there's an energy channel that opens up all throughout history until this very day where in that time period, there will be an opening for joy. Let's say this is when Passover hit in the Jewish calendar. There's an energy channel here all the way up through the years, through the decades, through the centuries, and through the millennium about opening up to freedom, making changes, breaking free. Uh, and so on and so forth. If this is the month of Av and the destruction of the temple, there's actually also a time for sadness. It's sort of like Ecclesiastes, right? A time for this, a time for that, a time, na, 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 na. So it's very true that in, in the Jewish year, there's energy channels. So in this time of Hanukkah, there's an energy channel for miracles, but it's never exclusive, right? There's always a time for joy, for freedom, for new beginnings, for sadness, as long as we're respecting our feelings. Okay, but... Spiritually speaking, there is also an energy coming that's open for miracles. So what? Neely, you still didn't address complaining. Well, now we have to ask ourselves, what is a miracle? What's a miracle? I, I, give, you a, I give you that pause again to ask you, what's a miracle? Technically, if you had to explain a miracle to a second grader, what would you say? Okay, so I might say that a miracle is where something is out of the norm. Something is extraordinary. Something is out of the realm of nature. A miracle essentially is when God changes his nature. So for example, the best example of this, I believe, is the splitting of the sea, right? Water has a tendency to come together, to unite, to be together. We know even according to science, I remember learning about this in seventh grade with Mrs. Patty Green, <laughs> that uh, we learned about this concept called a Mickey, which is scientifically, if you have a glass of water and here is the, the top, the surface of the water, if I pour more water, just a bit more water, it's going to hold on tight. It won't spill over the edge until a certain point because water has the tendency to come together. Another example that you could do is you have a flat surface and you pour a drip of water here and a drip of water right next to it. Somehow they come together. It's actually really wild. And even we have proof of this in the Hebrew language because the word for water is mayim, which is naturally plural. There is no singular way to say water. Even if you want to say a drop of water, you say a drop of the plural form of water because water's nature is to come together. Okay. So, for example, when God split the sea, that's called a miracle because God is changing his nature. He's changing the nature of nature and he's making it possible for water to split, which is against the nature of water against, let's say, God's nature. So that's how we define a miracle. So now God says, you want a miracle in your life? No problem. Change your nature. Okay, what are you talking about? 
All right, so here's what it is. So, in fact, this segula initially was specified or like directed at women. Now, I love women. I want women's empowerment. I believe in holy feminism, uh, that we should be, you know, you know, we're, we're, we should both be respected the same. Uh, we also do have to acknowledge our differences, our chemical differences, our natural differences, and there are some. So even though, again, like we said, even though this applies to the specific time of year, you can use it for the rest of the year, even though specifically a lot of this is directed at women, uh, well, men, it will work for you too. Also, as we know, men and women, we have femininity and masculinity within us. So what we're going to do at the moment is we're going to try to understand the woman, the nature of a woman. Now, yes, the nature of a woman is nurturing and it's caring and it's beautiful and it's empathetic and it's compassionate and it's all these wonderful things. Absolutely. Right. Give it up for the women. Whoop, whoop. Uh, in, in fact, really, it is a Kabbalistic idea that the woman will rise and return to her initial grandeur. So, you know, let's acknowledge that. And let's acknowledge some tough points, which is that according to our tradition, we have two things that are kind of associated with our nature, which are not so pleasant. So the first comes from the Garden of Eden, right? When we messed up and we offered Adam the fruit, well, we were cursed. And we were cursed, right? With sadness, we'll raise our children. So actually, we were cursed with sadness. And so you'll find that men might have an easier time just hanging out with the bros, right? Like things aren't going to bother them just as much. Like for us, like the littlest thing can make us sad, right? If you don't tell us we're pretty, we feel sad. If you don't, you know, tell us the food is good, we feel sad. It's like there's this really strong pull towards sadness. Okay. It doesn't mean it's within us or we're doomed to it, but we have an inclination, a tendency, a nature that kind of connects us with the Yitzhahara, the evil inclination of sadness. It's what it is, okay? Now, it doesn't mean that I'm labeling any given woman. Thank you, Hashem. I also have a tendency towards happiness personally, uh, and I bless everybody with that. But just for the sake of learning, even if this is a difficult concept to talk about men and women, just uh, let's ease up on our initial ideas and we'll gain something from it. So that's nature number one. And the Gemara says we have another nature. And this I don't think anyone's going to disagree with, okay? So women have a tendency to, what is it? Now that we've said all the positive points, she's nurturing, she's wonderful, she's lovely, she's caring, she's mothering. We also have a tendency to, ready? We're like birds, right? We just, we want to talk all the time. I mean, I work in the seminary system, so often I'm surrounded by 40 to 118 year old women. It's like, like if you go on a weekend retreat with these girls, like, and you don't have earplugs, your mouth, your mouth, your, your ears are going to be filled with talking the entire time. And again, stereotypically, it's true, right? Like, we talk a lot. That's what women do. We connect through speech. So now, what happens when you tap into these two natures, when you connect them? So we have sadness and speech. And so what do you get when you have sad speech? Complaining. Right? We have this tendency towards sadness and this tendency towards speaking. And sad speech is complaining. So it's we have a tendency to complain. And even, even if it's not a, a stereotype that you want to continue promoting, even you can see in all the movie and TV shows, if you're talking about a Jewish woman, she's going to get stereotyped or labeled as a complainer. And even Jewish people in general, right? We get stereotyped as complainers. And so it goes from the biblical times until this very day. You know, we can have it really, really good. We can live in mansions and have opportunity and privilege, and, and we're still going to find ourselves complaining. So we want to acknowledge that, that we have a tendency towards that in our nature. And then we want to find out, well, we ask God for a miracle, right? We said this whole idea that there's a segula, that you could have a miracle in your life if God says, I'll change my nature if you change yours. So now we want to step up to the challenge. And again, let's say you're not hitting this up in this time of year. That's cool. You could take on this challenge for 40 days. Uh, in Judaism, in any time of year, in Judaism, 40 is the number of transformation, right? Or birth, for example, 40 weeks of birth. 
Uh, we have 40, se uh, 40 measurements of water in the mikvah, which we go into for rebirth. 40 is the amount of days and nights that Moses was on Mount Sinai to receive the Torah. So the idea being if Moses could receive the entire Torah, all of divine infinite wisdom in 40 days, what can't we accomplish in 40 days? So if you want to take on this um, this custom or you want to take on this challenge, the no complaint campaign, the no complaint challenge, uh, the recommended time according to the sages is 40 days. So, but here's the thing. We said this is a Torah and psychology course. And if we're being true to our psychology, we can't BS ourselves. This is not a promotion for positivity. In fact, I learned from my mentor, positivity is just as much as a lie as negativity is, right? Um, if our complaint that we find ourselves complaining about every day is I look so fat, telling ourselves you have a beautiful body is not gonna satisfy anyone. That's just called BSing ourselves. We're not trying to positivize our speech and fool ourselves. We're not trying to fake it till we make it at all because we can't really deceive ourselves. And if we are practicing deception, then we're guilty of both complaining and practicing self-deception, neither of which are healthy practices. So let's figure out how we can undo the practice of complaining so that we can merit this miracle in our lives. Before we do that, I wanna just say, a lot of people have asked me because I've been practicing this for years and really encouraging other people to do the same. A lot of people have asked me, but Neely, what if I mess up? And I'm like, oh, you're gonna mess up. In fact, I started yesterday and I already messed up yesterday. <laughs> and I've already taught this course a number of times between yesterday and today. So like you'd say, I have it so much in my consciousness and I already messed up. Yeah, I messed up. Because we've been practicing complaining for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. It's not an easy thing to just work ourselves out of. It's okay. You don't lose the merit of the miracle by messing up if you catch yourself or if you ask God to help you do it better, right? So I complained about something and I said, oh, sorry, God, I know that was a complaint. Hashem, I really wanna be more conscious and aware. So it's okay if you mess up and it's okay if you mess up every single day for all the 40 days. The idea is to awaken the consciousness, to, to arouse the awareness so that we, again, can start changing that those synapses firing every time we have a certain thought that they stop firing into a complaint uttering from our mouth. Okay, so. Here are my favorite tips on how to transform our complaining without BSing ourselves or without self-deception. So uh, I have three simple techniques that I like to use. Uh, the first one is my favorite. So here's what it is. So a, a massive complaint that I hear often is, I'm starving. I'm so hungry. All right. So your body is saying you're hungry. Your head is realizing it. So what do you do? You can just transform it. And honestly, I've heard from so many people how this changed their lives. You just say, I'm so excited to eat. I'm so excited to eat, right? I'm starving. I haven't eaten anything all day. Wow. Oh my God. The first food in my mouth is going to be delicious. Ooh, I'm going to go home and make potatoes. Oh man, I can't wait to pass by the pizza store. So you turn the exact same bodily desire or even psychological desire, because you know we get hangry, right? We get hungry and angry, we get hangry. So it's like your, your need might not only be for physical food in your body, but maybe your head is feeling fuzzy, you're getting starting to get trigger happy. It's okay, we can acknowledge that by saying, I'm really looking forward to eating. I'm so excited to eat. Okay, so if you get that flip, we're not BSing ourselves. We're not saying, oh, well, there's people starving in Yemen, so you should be more grateful that you have food or that you will have food, you have money to buy food. No, 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 no. There's no shoulds. There's no expectations. There's a realistic transformation of what we're hoping for and learning how to express it not in a complaint. And again, you could go deeply into the psychology of faith and trust and all these things, but we'll leave that for another day. Okay, so let's say, you know, it's turning winter or maybe by you when you're watching this, it's turning summer. I'm freezing, I'm boiling, right? We often complain about the weather. I can't wait to get a sweater. I can't wait to get inside. I'm so excited to turn on the AC. Same expression of what your bodily discomfort is, but we learn how to express it differently. Like, wow, I can't wait to put on warm clothes. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to hop in a cold shower, right? Whatever the desire is, we turn the complaint into excitement about life. And then all of a sudden we have what to look forward to instead of digging ourselves into a miserable pit of depression and despair and sadness. You see, 
Uh, another complaint is I'm so tired. And these are real complaints, right? For anyone on here who's a mother or a dad, like, hello, you're tired. You really are tired, right? I'm so excited to sleep. Okay, so now let's say those don't resonate with you and doing the flip doesn't resonate. And again, doing the flip does resonate for a lot of people that I know and I, and I highly recommend it, right? If I feel sick, I'm so sick. I'm so sick. I can't wait to feel better. I'm so excited for the moment where this headache goes away. Let's say that doesn't work for you. Okay, well, let's go to the second idea, which is self-connection, self-compassion, self-empathy, right? If you're feeling fat and that, and you're feeling ugly, it's not going to help you to say, I'm so excited for when my body is fit. Because again, that's BS. You can't BS yourself. Like, no, I'm not so excited. I just feel really uncomfortable in my own skin right now, right? Maybe I have pimples and they're not going to go away in an hour when I get food or, you know, whatever it is that I'm uncomfortable about. Like, let's say I have thinning hair or let's say whatever, a number of different things. Or let's say I'm lonely and I want a relationship that's not necessarily happening in a couple hours or tonight. So I can't say I'm so excited to be in a relationship. That will be BS. So what do we do? We do self-connect. And when you want to say, I feel, oh, I look so ugly, you instead turn to yourself and you can give yourself a hug if you want, or you can rub your shoulder, or you can just sit and breathe, say whatever your name is. I would really recommend practicing this out loud. And there's Torah and psychological reasons for expressing it out loud. Uh, Our words create our reality on one foot. Say, Neely, I'm really sorry you have that pimple. That's really hard for you, you know, especially because you're going to give a class tonight and then they're all going to see and it's live and you probably feel really embarrassed and you probably really want people thinking you're beautiful. So it's probably really hard to feel that way. And you just go to whatever the feeling is in self-connect and self-empathy, right? Because we have, we have needs, And sometimes we can't get our needs met. So then what do you do? Do you just abandon your need? So let me explain this in a different way, okay? We have things that uh, in the world of psychology, there's called situational needs and relational needs, okay? So we use this with a simple example with a child. A child is told they're going to get ice cream. And then they go to the ice cream store and it's closed. And for whatever reason, there's no ice cream anywhere in sight. So the situational need, the, the fact that that child was so excited to get ice cream now their need is not going to be met. Or let's say the mom's purse gets stolen, God forbid, and she has no money. Well, kid's not getting ice cream. So do you say to the kid, okay, her purse got stolen. Okay, the store is closed. Buck up, deal with it. There's no ice cream. No, no, we wouldn't say that, right? So if they can't get their situational need met, the situation was they wanted to get ice cream, they could still get their relational need met. And this goes with us too. There's a lot of things in life we don't have right now. And we're not going to have right now. It's just not going to happen, right? Like, yes, anything can happen. And you can get a boyfriend by the end of the night. Or you can have courage to ask that girl out. Or you can, you know, start changing your body or your career. But it might not happen overnight. And then the fact is, situationally, you're out of luck, right? You're not getting that situational need. But it doesn't mean the game is over. We could still get our relational needs met. And what do I mean? We look at that little kid and we say, man, you were so excited. We relate to them. We relate to them. We can relate to ourselves. You really wanted that ice cream. You've been looking forward to double chunk chocolate peanut butter swirl for like months. And finally we're in the city, they have it and, and, and they're closed. And that's probably so hard. It was like, you feel rewarded when you get this ice cream and we could do this for ourselves, right? Right now, personally, I haven't been working out and I do really want to work out. I mean, okay, I don't, I don't really want to work out. That's not true. I really want to be in shape. I want to have a healthy body. I want to feel strong. I want to feel clear-minded, but I'm not starting tonight. Truth. It's not happening tonight. I, I, again, I got another class that I got to teach. I got to prepare before then. It's my work. It's in the situation isn't happening, but if I want to look in the mirror and say, oh, I still have that belly roll, like I don't need to go to self-pity. Woe is me complaining. I'm so blah, 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 whatever. All the complaining. It's not about self-pity and and just finding another excuse to, it's like a a pleasurable excuse, really. Like we get pleasure out of self-pity because it feeds the ego. This is not about self-pity. This is about self-connect. Wow, Neely, 
you have been wanting to get in shape for like a year and it is hard for you to see yourself this way and you, you don't feel good in your clothes. I'm sorry, Neely. It probably makes you feel insecure. It probably makes you feel uncomfortable. It probably makes you, you know, just not even want to get dressed. That's hard. So in the second option of self-connect, we can really try to relate to our needs even if the situation isn't there. And in this way, it really helps us alleviate complaining because complaining, again, it's in the line of self-pity and that is connected to the pleasure of the ego for, it's like an ego tantrum, like, I don't, I have this, but we're not trying to tantrum. We're trying to go to self and connect to self. Okay, so the first option was a, a holy rephrase that still embraces the truth of the situation, right? Not I'm hungry, oh deal with it, people are starving, but I'm hungry is I'm so excited to eat. I love this chick. The second chick is self-connect. Okay, you can't get your situation on these bait. Can you connect yourself? Can you offer yourself empathy, compassion, understanding, softness, either through words or through touch or just through breath or being there for yourself, being your own best friend? Right? This can help alleviate complaining. And the third thing, which is really cool and it gets us a double benefit, is prayer. Right? Let's say I'm so annoyed at this person. I just want to complain about them. Hashem, God, can you please help me deal with this person? Or again, I'm tired and I, and I don't find a way that I'm going to be able to sleep. I have to pick up the kids from school. I have to do this. I have to do that. Hashem, can you please give me energy? We pray about our need. Whatever it is, oh my God, there's so many dishes. Hashem, please help me have a good attitude to do these dishes. I'm finding it really hard, Hashem. Please help me. And we turn every complaint into a prayer. And I find that between one of these three tricks, I'm almost always successful in turning a complaint around. And whether it's before the complaint happened and I wanted to utter it, or if I uttered the complaint and now I want to fix myself up, I can turn to one of these three simple techniques and all of a sudden, I start watching myself transform. And the beauty is with it comes increased gratitude. And with increased gratitude comes increased connection to God, the giver of all things. And when we're more connected to God, uh, well, everything flows from there because God is the source of all blessing. And when we're connected to the source of all blessing, not only do we stop complaining, but actually blessing starts to enter into our lives. So... Um, I hope that you enjoyed today's lesson on the miracle that could happen in our lives when we change our nature, right? Just as we learned that a miracle in nature is when God changes his nature and we can change our nature by refraining from complaining. Um, again, I highly recommend looking up complaining on Ted talks or on YouTube or finding out the, the scientific explanation, the biological, the chemistry, all of the biology and the chemistry of what happens when we complain and the psychology and what happens when we incline towards prayer and self-connect and gratitude, that we actually pave the way for miracles in our life, both the ones that God will reward us with for attempting to improve ourselves and improve our character in this world, and the miracles that we're na will naturally outflow from uh, getting more excited about things that are coming in life that we don't yet have and from tuning into ourselves and working with self-connect and from tuning into God. You know, what happens when we start doing that third tactic of prayer is we find ourselves connecting to God multiple times a day and the reward for connection with God is faith. And wow, faith, if faith isn't the key to everything, I don't know what it is, right? So I'm blessing us to try out these techniques to even just gain more awareness of how often we're complaining in our minds or out loud, and to see if those hundred times a day where I'm complaining, I could turn it into excitement or self-connect or connect to God, if I won't just see natural miracles from that transformation. And like we said, again, we will also see supernatural miracles as a gift, as a reward from God from doing this personal work. So thank you so much for tuning in today. Uh, so grateful for the opportunity to explore these profound concepts with you that are both simple and can be applied to everyday life. And uh, God bless. Can't wait to see you on the next episode.